So as Jürgen has said, my talk today is on the prevention of peanut allergy, um, but also the challenges that we might face. And, and we have many challenges in, in a field of um, exclusion, avoidance, but what we would call active allergy management. So actually trying to change the way the UK feels in introducing nuts into the diet to induce oral tolerance. So I'm going through some of the challenges today to understand, first of all, I, I know that you will have had presentations already on um, food allergy per se, but looking at the presentation diagnosis of management of peanut allergy, I'm not going into, into huge depth, but to get you into the flavor of the topic and to understand why peanut allergy is such a big problem. And then to maybe develop a little bit more on what Liam has said about the immune mechanisms for a sensitization intolerance, but associated with peanut allergy. And then I've kept it very simple, <clears throat> just looking at the LEAP study leap on, leap in, and a little bit about how the EAT study has been beneficial in the introduction of peanut into the diet. And then I'm just going to mention the two studies on um, desensitization, but I've kept it very simple that I hope um, you will um, follow the trail of thought. So peanut allergy for all of us, we now know, um, is a res it's a food allergy. It's a response to the immune system of something that we would normally otherwise tolerate. Um, what happens in the immune system is that the peanut protein, and we now have component resolved diagnostic testing, so the proteins might be something similar to ARA H2, 8 and 9. You might be hearing these in your clinic letters at the moment. But these po uh, these proteins might induce antibodies, and it's these antibodies that send out an inappropriate immune response. But what we do know globally, not just in the UK, but also in Australasia, Canada, the US, the recommendation has always been, if you're allergic, then please do avoid. Now, this has been for, you know, over the last two decades, what the message has been. But there have been scientists and indeed clinicians who over the last 10 years have actually questioned this. And they've asked it, should we be trying a different strategy? And indeed, if we had repeated exposure to the immune system with or with mild microbiome, indeed, would we induce oral tolerance? So the evidence comes from many a theory, um, but it was Gideon Lack's group um, with George Dutour who actually started thinking about, should we be looking at this in a different way? So why is peanut allergy a big problem? Why is it from none, as opposed to many of the other food allergies that we have? Well, what we do know is it's doubled in the last 10 years. And indeed, there has always been this a complete avoidance, not only for our diet, but also for the lactating mother, but also for parents uh, in, in, for parent mothers in pregnancy. But even before that, we are now three generations of grandmother, mother and child, and now next generation who have no exposure to peanut uh, at all. So why is it particularly troublesome? Well, there are food allergies out there, but peanut especially seems to be quite volatile, can lead to anaphylaxis and sudden death, but so can many of the other nut stories. And maybe it's just that we don't focus so much on it as we do in the literature, um, but I do know that cashew and walnut are just as volatile as nuts. So in, a, in avoidance, these children really struggle. It, it's hard to not be able to have anything that says traces of nuts. And indeed now, because of legal reasons, so many foods say may contain traces, even vulvic water. It is difficult to know what can our children eat or not eat. And it breeds uh, an era of food refusal, phobia and anxiety um, along the way. So we all know about the acute hypersensitivity reactions. We know what's IgE mediated. And I know that you all know about anaphylaxis um, and the presentation thereof. So I'm not really going to go into that today, but to know that actually the, we've had the recent pret case, which has really via the media caused a heightened awareness, um, and quite rightly so. We've been saying for many a time um, in the immunology field and in the food field uh, that there are the risks associated uh, with food allergy. And what we would usually say in clinic is not to take a risk when you're unwell with fever, exercising, abroad or about to take a plane or a boat, if you're indeed in a remote area in the highlands of Scotland, for instance, and indeed dining out with family and friends. We put these five risks in every single one of our letters, but it's no point just putting it in the letter. There's no point in giving that to the teenager's mother. The point is, is that the children understand this and that these five risks are embedded in what they do because it is them who will be able to say, no, I'm not going to have that sandwich that's unlabeled. I'm not going to applaud that flight because I don't feel well. And therefore they develop ownership. 
But it all comes down to the understanding of what peanut allergy is. And indeed, Liam has already um, alluded to the whole issue of the inflammatory child versus the non-inflammatory child. And this was a marker paper by, again, George Dutoy and groups who have said already that when you've got inflamed um, uh, barriers, that you have your dendritic cell here, which will grab the allergen through the skin and create um, a cascade of a cytokine um, milieu, which will indeed, with no microbiome, cause the allergic inflammatory cascade. For me, when you think about peanuts, we don't eat peanuts because in Britain we're not allowed to eat them till we're five because we might choke, but we never said no peanut butter or Nutella spread. But it is the whole ethos that has evolved around the whole discussion. Whereas in the Mediterranean, it seems to be fine that most children still had nut butters despite having a disruptive skin barrier or not. So we therefore think about, actually, are barriers important? And this is Helen Bruff's work, and it goes back in 2013 already, where she showed in her work that actually if you look at the amount of dust of peanut and other allergens in homes between the bedroom and the living room, that actually those of ch all children versus those who had a history of severe atopic dermatitis, you can see here that if you've got a disruptive skin, that indeed allergen does get through the skin, and if you're not eating it to go into the glands, your submandibular glands, does this make you more atopic and skew your immune system to allergy? So indeed, the guidelines over the last 20 years have been different. In 2000, they said delay introduction of all foods, no cow's milk till you were one, no egg till you were two, and peanuts, tree nuts, nuts, and shellfish, nothing till you're five. But then you come to 2008, but there was no convincing evidence. And already in 2012 with the, with the Evelina group, there was this emerging data that actually complementary feeding might increase the risk of allergy, but actually did it? Or did it slowly have an effect of immune tolerization? So the story starts way back um, where Gideon Lack's group knew that children also in Africa and Australasia, but in a, a Jewish community in Israel, comparing to all of us here in the United Kingdom, they had a far lower prevalence of peanut allergy here competing to the UK. And what was the difference? And Liam's already said, across the borders, different diet, different culture, different household. Well, the difference is the bamba snack. And this is a soft peanut cheesy Watson. There's no cheese in this, but it's just like the cheesy what's it. It just dissolves in a baby's mouth. And we grew up with this in Africa. It is what we all loved. We even had peanut crisps. You don't have any of that here in the UK. But you'll find this slowly creeping into all our supermarkets. And more and more, you see the shelves are getting more prolific. When we talk about nut, nut butters, nut bars, the naked bar, it's suddenly become really popular. So the problem with this is if we now give this to our population, it's fine for the new babies coming through, but how about those that are really atopic? Will giving them this induce oral tolerance? So this is what brought the learning early about peanut allergy trial. This is um, a, a very popular um, trial that has made its mark in, in the UK and worldwide. But indeed, through the Immune Tolerance Network, you can see on their website um, a running commentary of these studies of where they are now. And they will indeed follow up these patients long term. But if you look at this set of data, they took 640 children between 4 and 11 months of age, and they were trying to identify which of those were high risk of peanut allergy. And what we know is the child with severe atopic dermatitis is 11 times more likely to have egg allergy and 7 times more likely to have nut allergy. And the reasons for that might be is that's what's around the breakfast table. We don't know, but we know from Helen Bruff's work that they do sensitize and it is in the dust in our home environment. So how did they identify which children to put into the LEAP study? So they looked into different forms of whether it was your ethnic group increasing of risk or whether indeed they had four groups here looking at the different types of skin prick testing results for different types of food, whether you had severe eczema or not, and indeed looking at just generalized data, but also peanut data. And what they decided was the high risk group for the LEAP study was indeed those who had severe eczema, who were already peanut allergic and who had uh, sensitized to egg. They then looked at various screening components, looked at other different levels of skin prick testing results and their specific IgE.
So here is the LEAP study. This is the design diagram. And what you can see here is between the three-year period of recruitment, looking for the right sort of babies, they finally included 640 infants with severe eczema and egg allergy into two arms, the intervention group and the control group. But because of the way they were sensitized through the skin, they have slipped them into positive and negative skin prick testing, whether they were actively eating peanut or whether they were not. And then the study looked at, well, if you've got these two groups, now we follow them through to see actually if we introduce peanut very early, between four and 11 months of age, do they go on to develop allergy? And indeed, they will follow through to see on leap on, do they develop other forms of atopic disease? All children who were in this study received testing, dietary counseling, but also had uh, blood testing results looking for component specific IgEs in the allergy repertoire. So when you look at their results here, this is the prevalence of allergy on the y-axis. And if you look along the three graphs, this is the relative reduction that they had for those that were skin prick test negative, those that were skin prick test already positive, below four millimeters, and those here who were both cohorts. And what was highly, highly statistically significant is even when you look at all of them across the bar, it's highly significant that in the consumption group, there was far less prevalence of allergy already at one year. They then went to look even further to say, well, actually, in the United Kingdom, when we look at ethnic minority groups, some of these children have really quite severe eczema, marked failure to thrive. Well, are they at more risk of nut allergy? But when they looked at their results, actually, in the consumption group, no peanut allergy at all. So when you introduce to, the, to these ethnic groups peanut very early in life, just as they would do in their own home environment, so we all grew up on peanut soup as children. That's what Australasia and, and, and um, Asia, but also in Africa, that's the kind of thing you grow up with. If you give it back to them in this country, we have got a good result here, but whether it's nature or nurture still needs to be thought. The Leap On study, therefore, has looked at these children now one year on. So 556 out of the 640 children. And you can see here that they still had 274 children who were still peanut consumers, so still managing their peanut, and 282 who had previously been peanut avoiders. And they had a one-year intervention. And what they've done is followed up now, post the Leap study, how many have become peanut allergic and how many haven't. And what you can see here is 4.8% of the original group was found to be allergic, but those who did not introduce peanut into the diet at that early age, 18.6, that's a threefold difference, which is highly statistically significant and important. So now when we look at the LEAP-ON follow-up data, they have definitely uh, summarized that the early consumption of peanuts in high risk, children high risk of peanut allergy, um, is is allergy specific to that allergen. So if we're talking about peanut here, the LEAPON study cannot say that the same would be for egg, wheat, or soy or other tree nuts. And what they do know is that having peanut introduced early does not prevent the allergic disease, or they cannot say now that it prevents the allergic disease of other foods. And therefore, it needs further intervention to look at bringing foods in early of all the other foods would be of any benefit. So what about other foods? If we have concentrated here on peanut, what about all the other foods and bringing this into our diet, be it for mum or be it for our breastfed babies? This is the um, early acquisition of tolerance study by Michael Perkin and colleagues. And here you can see that they screened and randomized over a thousand infants into the early introduction group, what we call the egg group of foods at a very early stage of four months. And here we have the standard introduction group where they all had exclusive breastfeeding, but this group here were as per normal guidance, guidance that we have within the UK already. And they were screened monthly and then three monthly to look at their allergy repertoire. So both groups, we had the introductory group, all exclusively breastfeeding and the standard group. And what's interesting here is they introduced five or more allergenic foods at least 75% of what is recommended, um, and at least five or four more weeks between the months of three to six months of age. And this is a diagram of roughly how much food these babies had to have. And I don't know how many of you are dietitians or nutritionists amongst us, but this is a lot to be able to manage when you're such a small age. 
two fish fingers, two small pots of cow's milk yogurt, a wheat biscuit, cereal, small hard-boiled egg, three rounded teaspoons of peanut butter, and three teaspoons of tahini paste. This is quite a lot for a four-month baby. Now, they're not all at once, but it is regular. <laughs> and when you see the little stars, you think, actually, that is very different to what we do now. And when you talk to the dietitians amongst us, they would say, well, actually, they're not sitting yet. Their neurological composture is not right for early introduction. And so I think this sort, sort of study indeed was done with nutritionists, dietitians, to make sure that children were in that capacity before they started. But there's a lot more to think about on this front when we think about the breastfeeding guidance and the introduction of foods. If we were to move that we introduce peanut at four months of age, I think the dietitians would be worried, well then, in good British style, people might then start early at three months or even two months. So I think the guidance is very much to stay at six months, but this study very clearly starts to show that actually we can introduce food safely at this age. So when we think about adherence for the EAT study, 42% of the early introductory group managed the protocol doses as opposed to 92% for the standard introduction, and, and we can see why. It's a lot of food to introduce, and what they've said is that it was easy for them to introduce cow's milk and peanut because peanut butter was fine for them to tolerate, um, much more than obviously grounded nuts. And when you look at their results, you can see the intention to treat analysis here, which was their main protocol, 20% reduction in the allergy group, the per protocol overall, but when you adjust it per protocol, so if you had the same children um, as per the amount of children who could actually manage the protocol, it was much more significant, but not highly statistically significant. When we then look at the prevalence and sensitization in peanut only, you can see here that again, we have an introduction, but if you look at per protocol or adjusted per protocol, introducing peanut early did not induce allergy, if anything, nothing at all. So highly favorable um, and indeed beneficial. If we then look at one or more foods as they had, five or more foods, you can see there is induction at 12 and 36 months. So whatever the team did there at, at uh, six months to one year has still continued. So overall, um, I think we're not there yet. And we are definitely having to think about if we've got a population of children who are highly atopic to peanut, how can we introduce peanut into the diet safely? We have a whole generation of young adults with severe eczema or not who may be peanut sensitized and allergic. So the only other way we're thinking about bringing foods in is desensitization or immunotherapy. And what we know is the Palisade study was, has been um, now in the literature in November 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here we have the company who've produced the R101. This is 600 milligrams of a characterized peanut product for oral immunotherapy. And here, just talking about the pediatric cohort, four to 17 years of age, 488 children um, on one year of treatment. And what their results have shown so far is that 67% have tolerated the protein compared to 4% of the placebo. <coughs> and when we look at the completers, 85% of the main group and 4% of the uh, placebo group have passed the food challenge at the end of the study. But here you can see in the active group, we had 20% withdrawal, one in five, that's quite high withdrawal rate. And you can see here 13% adverse reactions and by those, they mean our perioral erythema, lip swelling, urticaria, and some respiratory compromise, but 7% anaphylaxis rates quite high. Um, when you compare this to our normal challenge data on the ward, that is, that is a decent um, elevation. One case of severe anaphylaxis, and one case developed eosinophilic esophagitis. In the placebo group, only 7% withdrew and 2% with adverse reactions. And in a way, this is encouraging that we didn't have a high placebo effect. The 101 met its primary endpoint, and indeed it was then given permission by the FDA for the biologics license application to go further forward for further research. When we think, well, is there any other main way of immunotherapy? There's the epicutaneous, um, what we call the peanut patch. This is the group who are doing the Viaskin 
um, epicutaneous immunotherapy. And for Peanut, in February 2014, they were given permission to go ahead as a patch for treatment and allergy for children, again, between 4 and 11 years of age. But here they found using a via skin um, application of only 250 micrograms in children, it did not meet its end primary, um, the primary endpoint with 35% in the treatment group and 14% in the uh, placebo group completing the trial. I don't know what everyone feels. It would be good for discussion afterwards on the use of epicutaneous immunotherapy, especially in children with eczema. Is this the route forward? But I do know that the trials that are coming out in our next 10 years generation include vaccines, vaccines with an adjuvant, also immunotherapy with microbiome. So it's a really hot topic. Um, and I think this is the most challenging area that we will have. It will change the face of allergy. We will definitely be um, doing far more immunotherapy in our challenge departments rather than food challenges. So in summary, complementary foods can be introduced between four and six months of age, and peanut included helps for further induction of oral tolerance. There's currently no data to suggest that any of these foods introduced into the diet early delays um, the presentation of allergy. And new data is emerging that if we use baked products, that uh, indeed we induce oral tolerance better, but this is not so for peanut or for tree nuts. Um, and with all these new immunotherapy trials coming out, I think, as Jürgen was saying, I think these will be the challenges in the future um, to see which will be the best platform um, for our younger and older children. So thank you for listening.